Hi everybody, I am here with Jen and she is a yin yoga teacher and an insight yoga teacher over at Sati Yoga and she's here to talk to us today a little bit how, a little bit about how yin yoga can help people living with chronic illnesses. Hi Jen. It's good to be here, thank you. Yeah, thank you for taking the time to chat with me. Um, do you want to start just by telling us a little bit about yourself and your work and kind of how you got to where you are now? Yeah, so I started practicing yoga um, probably about 16, 17 years ago. I was actually really drawn to the mental health benefits of the practice. Uh, I Around the time that I started practicing, I was going through a big life change, um, a long-time relationship had disintegrated and there was a lot of fallout from that. And I was really struggling with um, making new friends and finding a new scene and and um, was, was you know, battling a lot of negative self-talk and lack of confidence and, and all the things that go along with that. And it's it's part of my my history. So I, I knew, at least during this round, that so I needed a better way of managing it. And what I first tried was actually rock climbing. I was, I got really into hanging out at the rock climbing gym and, and people who know me are like, well, you know, why are you doing that? That's not really my thing. <laughs> Dirt, rocks. <laughs> but I would tell people that, you know, nothing turned my mind off, like trying not to die. And that was really um, why I liked rock climbing. And, you know, that's not really sustainable, though, and in, in, in putting yourself in danger is not really the best way to address mental health <laughs> issues. Um, so there was, a, there was a, a yoga class being taught at the climbing gym where I was hanging out. And so I, I finally um, you know, kind of made the decision to give it a try. And I don't even know what I was expecting. I certainly wasn't expecting that. I just, I knew that a lot of the climbers enjoyed it and I was getting into that. So, okay, well, I'll try this too. But I was, I was blown away. I was really, really taken aback. Uh, not only did it quiet my mind, but I, I wasn't having to try not to die while doing <laughs> that. And it, and it seemed to last a little longer. You know, when, as soon as I'd come off of a route, there would be a kind of euphoria of, of doing something really exciting. But at the same time, uh, you know, the next day I would be back at work and all the same stuff would still be there. With the yoga, it seemed to last a little longer. And and part of that, I think, is the style that I stumbled, across, stumbled upon. Uh, this teacher um, trained with um, Dana Namba of the Nosara Yoga Institute, which is mm -hmm. now being called Self-Awakening Yoga. They're, they're rebranding it. Um, but that's part of the Kripalu Yoga family tree, um, which is a much more um, mindful, meditative approach to yoga. It's not super vigorous, although you could practice it in a, in a, in a more vigorous way. But it's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of rolling around on the floor, a lot of breath work, a lot of cueing around paying attention you know notice how this feels notice how this feels before and after during and and so i didn't i didn't know what was happening at the time but she was training us to maintain a continuity of awareness on one thing and mm -hmm. it was convenient because we were moving the body around but this is this is a skill we need in daily life too the ability to um, prevent the mind from just running off on all these tangents. And for me, the tangents were always a lot of negative self-talk. So mm -hmm. that was, that was really beneficial. I was able to rein some of that in. I, I, she, she opened a studio and so I, I followed her to the studio and I, mm -hmm. and started taking classes like two or three times a week. And when she decided to offer teacher training, I, I jumped on it and it wasn't because I wanted to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. It was because I was really curious, okay, here I was taking classes two or three times a week, and I was getting this much benefit out of it. What could I get? You know, could I level it up and, um, and, and know a lot more about it, know, understand the history, you know, peel back the layers and try to understand why, and then could I make it even more powerful? Like, I was really interested in, and I don't know, I didn't, I didn't even know what the next level was, but I, I was interested in finding <laughs> out what that would be. And mm -hmm. so I, I jumped in and um, about two thirds of the way or maybe three quarters of the way into it. You know, they when you go through teacher training, whether you're going to teach or not, they make you practice teaching. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I, I, I realized that I enjoyed that too. And, and the thing about teaching yoga, and you probably feel this way too, it's, it's yoga. You're, you're having yoga for yourself, or you're, you're giving it to yourself while you're teaching. You're very in the moment. You're very aware of what's going on. You're very tuned in to a number of different factors. You know, things can be going on around you and you don't even notice because you're really in the moment when you're mm-hmm. teaching. One of the things that I love about teaching um, that you don't get from a personal practice is the training up the capacity to be aware of other people. Mm. You know, yoga is so internally focused and that's that's fantastic, but teaching yoga trains you up to notice the details in other people, their posture, their speech, their body language. Um, you can do that in a room full of people. So I, I find that I end up applying that skill to daily life all the time. You know, I go to a meeting and I can I relate to the people in the room in a different way, I think, than I did before teaching. So I, I really enjoyed that. And I, and it was a surprise. So mm-hmm. I, I decided to teach, um, when I got out. So, and that was back in, that was almost 14 years ago. So <laughs> it's been a while. Mm-hmm. Um, I am where I am today teaching yin yoga and insight yoga, uh, because about seven years ago after my daughter was born, everything just kind of fell apart. <laughs> my body hurt. Um, I developed a chronic back condition that I probably, it was probably congenital and I just didn't, um, I didn't have the body that was bothered by it until after gaining all the weight for pregnancy and, mm-hmm. and getting out of shape. Cause that's what happens when you get pregnant. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I emerged from postpartum in my postpartum life with a lot of pain in my body and it spent, mm-hmm. it took me years to figure out what was going on and, and how to take care of it. Um, that's why this, this call was so interesting to me because Mm -hmm. I was like, oh yeah, (laughs) but, um, so I found yin yoga as an antidote because my vinyasa practice was not helping, you know, the, the emphasis on opening and expanding was not helping. I needed stillness. I was exhausted from being a new mom and, and I needed everything that yin yoga offers and, and, and particularly the mindfulness, I was really drawn to Sarah Powers, the um, insight yoga, mm-hmm. because because she uses the yin yoga postures as an opportunity to practice meditation, which is something that's become a really important part of my life and mm-hmm. keeps me grounded and sane and present, especially now that I have an eight year old and and um you know, all the demands of, of being a parent too. So Mm -hmm. I teach it and I practice it. It's, it's, it's really my love now for the past seven years. So so (laughs) lovely. That's so beautiful. What you said about teaching and expanding your awareness and your mindfulness to another person. And I, I mean, hearing you talk about your story and I know from following your blog and your website, that mindfulness is really important to you and that staying present in the moment is really important to you. So can you tell us a little bit more about why you think it's so important in a yoga practice and even outside of a yoga practice? So, I mean, we just talked a little bit about parenting, but kind of yeah. what kind of mindfulness practices you do outside of yoga? Yeah, so I think the benefits for me really go back to my original interest in yoga, which was the mental health benefits that I was receiving. And I didn't know it at the time, and, it, and it, I think I... I came out of teacher training with a little more understanding about what it was in my yoga practice that was helping me with that. And, and it was the, um, attentional or you could say attitudinal parts of practice, especially the style that I was learning, the, the pay attention, the notice, the, you know, keep coming back to the breath, you know, that those are mindfulness practices, whether, um, you know, they come from Buddhism or, the Hatha traditions in India, it's all, it's all the same stuff. And maybe the language is a little different for it, but, you know, reminding your students or yourself to keep returning, you get distracted, keep coming back. Mm -hmm. That's a mindfulness practice. So it was always there. When I came out of teacher training, I realized what it was and I immediately sought out meditation class and, um, found that to be a, a really helpful part of my personal development is actually taking a little extra care to work on that. And so, and getting, and, you know, in yoga, especially because it's so asana focused, a a lot of times, even if that's part of the overall atmosphere of a yoga class, or at least mindfulness is, the the tension is often on 
um, technical aspects or, you know, getting through sequences or moving around. So I found at the time, you know, this is going back almost 14 years, the only way I could get some direct instruction for the, the mental stuff was go to mindfulness teachers. Mm-hmm. And, and slowly you start to see people bring this together. I, I took a workshop very early on with Cindy Lee, who used to teach out in New York. Um, her books and practices called Om Yoga. And she was teaching some Buddhist practices uh, with yoga as well. But she was, it was still a little bit sequential. It's like, okay, here's some meditation at the beginning. Here's a practice. And she might talk a little bit about the middle path and, and paying attention. And then here's some more meditation at the end. And when I, when I start studying with Sarah, she, she mixed it all together <laughs> and in a way that I, that was um, really helpful for me because, you know, when you go to meditate and you're trying to sit there, often your body hurts or, um, you know, a lot of different things can distract you in a different sort of way. And when you put yourself in a pose, you've got a little bit of feeling to hold your attention. If the breath isn't, isn't enough of an anchor, um, you know, you're, you're doing it in, in smaller chunks of time. So you can start to build up the capacity to be still, and maybe you can stretch that out a little bit over time. So that's kind of how I apply it and how I practice and, and what drew me to Sarah. I think there, in my own practice, I still blend the two. Mm -hmm. I, I will do a little bit of a formal meditation at the beginning just to kind of assess how I'm doing and maybe, um, and we'll talk about this, I think in a little bit, but, um, I use that time to check in with my physical health, my mental health, my emotional health, my energy body. And then, and then I will, um, do some poses. Sometimes it's yin, sometimes it's a little more vigorous, just depends on what I learned when I checked in and then I'll do, I'll do the practice and then I might do a more formal sit afterwards. Or if I'm doing a lot of yin, I'll just use that as my meditation time too. Mm-hmm. Did I, did I touch on all your questions? You did. <laughs> a little you. rambly. <laughs> um, are there any other self care activities you commit to other than yoga and mindfulness that you think have helped you with your mental health or with your struggles after pregnancy? Yeah. So postpartum, I realized um, I needed to do more strength training. I needed, I did Pilates for a little while um, mm-hmm. and I liked it, except they used to give me headaches because I would get so much tension in my neck and shoulders. <laughs> um, I really, for a while I got into, and I want to get back into it, but I need to find it on my schedule. Um, high intensity interval training. Mm-hmm. Are you familiar with that? A little you know, bit. Kettlebells and TRX. And um, I just think it's really fantastic. You know, in, in yoga, we tend to move along a single plane here Mm-hmm. or to the side, right? And with those other things, you know, you're doing things out in this direction or out in this direction. You're moving in different ways. There's pulling because we don't get mm-hmm. any pulling in yoga. So it, it felt like much more of a, a full body experience when I would do hit. So I, I really like that. I do try to swim a couple times a week. Um, my, my doctor, after I figured out what was going on with my back, said I shouldn't run. You know, I kept trying to have her be a jogger and She's mm-hmm. like, that's the worst thing for you. Um, so she's like, try swimming or something. And so I swim to try and get my cardio. Um, I walk my daughter to school every day, which is really nice. Um, mm-hmm. Get outside. We have a canoe. We like to get out and paddle. It's another st- other stuff that oh, that's so different <laughs> different movements. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the biggest thing that I've been really focusing on lately has been my diet, and 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 that's because I. My, my Chinese medicine doctor thinks it's hormonal, especially mm-hmm. postpartum, even though it's eight years ago now. But, um, you know, and I'm also 43, so I've got a lot of things in flux with my hormone system. But it's been messing up my digestion. So I, I saw him out, and he's got me on a special diet for my constitution, herbs that I take with my meals, um, acupuncture treatments on a regular basis and he's really into yin yoga so he'll be like okay work on these meridians and I'll go and I'll put mm-hmm. that in my practice so it's it's been really helpful I've I've seen a great reduction of uh, of inflammation in my body my digestive issues have cleared up so it's it's that's something I'm really interested in 
um, is to keep exploring that aspect of it too, because, you know, it's not just movement. We've got to look at the whole picture. Mm -hmm, Definitely. That's really interesting. You could uh, send me his link and I can include it as well in the the post for this because I think, yeah, some people would be really interested in learning more. Yeah, he's a cool guy. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely. Um, So let's now talk a little bit about fibromyalgia and, and chronic fatigue syndrome specifically. And how do you think yin yoga in particular can help people with those conditions? Yeah, so I'll start with fibromyalgia. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I, right before we, for I, um, early this week, I made sure I went back and I looked it up because I hadn't, hadn't looked in into, a, into it in a while. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, the, the research is changing all the time. And so I was really curious if there was any new information that I hadn't, hadn't considered. I've got a number of friends with fibromyalgia who are yoga teachers. So Mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely, you know, people can practice with these conditions. My mom had chronic fatigue when I was growing up Mm -hmm. way before we even knew what it was. And Mm -hmm. she went through the whole situation of, um, going to doctors and doctors are telling her there's nothing wrong with you and, and that whole thing. Um, Mm -hmm. so I, I have a, a, I have a, 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 a spot in my heart for, for people who suffer through these things. Um, so fibromyalgia, as I understand, is very exacerbated by stress, right? So mm-hmm. one of the things that I have found about my own practice and what I think is probably really beneficial for people dealing with not only fibromyalgia, but probably chronic um, fatigue as well, is the stress-reducing aspects of it. You know, coupled with the fact that um, you're not taxing the body through a lot of movement on top of it. So I think, you know, one of my friends with fibromyalgia teaches Ashtanga and practice mm-hmm. it. So I, I think you, if you are fit, you can do things that are more vigorous. But if, if you're coming at this from, from you know, less uh, of a physical lifestyle, then something like yin is going to be probably a better place to start so that you can start to learn a little bit better about what your triggers are, what what poses help, what poses don't. Uh, I think you know yin because you're still you have a, you have a little time to sit there and, and and really think about is this right for me? You know, by time you get to the next pose in a vinyasa class, you you've already forgotten <laughs> what what was just going on, and, unless it really sticks out. You know, mm-hmm. um, you know by time you get to the end, you might be sitting there going, I don't know if that felt right, but you maybe maybe can't pinpoint exactly what it was that that wasn't beneficial but with yin you you get that experience of really knowing this isn't feeling good (laughs) maybe next time i will skip this pose so Mm -hmm. i think i think that's an aspect that it's helpful for yin um you know and another thing too that's that's kind of interesting around fascia science is um you know this doesn't surprise anybody, but we do kind of walk around holding tension in our body. You know, the stress that we experience in our life manifests physically. And I mean, you're, you said you were from Toronto. Mm-hmm. And you know, you know, when you walk around the cold, <laughs> you come inside and you're like, I can't stop being like this. <laughs> I'm kind of stuck. You know, that's just an example of like an environmental um, event that causes us to hold and it can take a little while to let that go. But if we're walking around, with constant tension all the time, we, we eventually forget that that's how we are. And I think that along with that comes a lot of fatigue and the sense of feeling run down and you don't know why. And in yoga, but I think yin yoga in particular, because it emphasizes beingness and stillness and being quiet and receptive, it invites an atmosphere where we can soften some of that unconscious holding. And I know when I Whenever I um, come out of a yin practice, I I feel lighter. I feel I feel more flexible, but it's not length. It's not expansion. It's just it's my it's more supple. It's like mm. it's like clay that's been worked a little bit, and I think that's the unwinding of held tension. I don't really think that I'm getting more flexible through my practice. I think I'm moving myself back to my natural baseline, mm. and I think that's maybe an area where um, people with these conditions can explore too. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I, I think these are really I think this is a really interesting place to explore. I, I don't know if we have a lot of really definitive answers for people. Mm-hmm. I looked up I looked up when I looked up chronic fatigue. 
They still don't know what it is. They still don't know what causes it. They still don't know how to fix it. But there was a study. This was actually in Yoga Journal mm -hmm. from a few years ago that said of all these interventions that they looked at, yoga helped the best. And the, and the researchers was like, I don't even practice yoga. I don't even know why. Yeah. <laughs> but I think we can make some guesses. Those of us mm -hmm. who practice, it's the stress relief. It's the pain management. It's the it's everything, the community of people who care about their health and being mm -hmm. surrounded by people who are like that. And, and the little ways that, that your lifestyle starts to shift when you get into yoga. I, I, think, I think it creates an, a healing atmosphere, if mm -hmm. nothing else. Yeah. And and we need that because the rest of the world is not a healing atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's one of the reasons why this stuff works, even if we can't say exactly why. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of the community and the atmosphere because I know I talk a lot about, you know, what's going on in the body and the stress release and stuff. Um, but that's so important because I know so many people with these conditions might not have a healing atmosphere at home. They might have people who don't understand what they're going through and don't understand the severity of their conditions. Mm -hmm. And especially because Western medicine can't understand it. It's just there's no. no kind of baseline. And people, I think, in the yoga committee, community are much more open to understanding mm -hmm. the subtler things that are going on in the body. Yeah, so. and you know, I remember watching my mom and the doctors be like, you know, suck it up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you're like... But, you know, she couldn't get out of bed. It was, you know, and mm -hmm. something was going on. And, you know, and to find people who um, respect that there are mysteries that science can't explain and that mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that we should give up on them is, is huge. Mm -hmm. So finding that community, I, I think, is really helpful. Mm -hmm, definitely. Um, I think we covered this a little bit, but could you just talk briefly about how yin yoga affects the body differently than a, a more active hatha or vinyasa practice? Yeah, so <laughs> you'll have to cut me off if I get too, too <laughs> down in the weeds. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think it's helpful to back up a little bit and talk talk a little physiology, if that's okay. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, so first of all, I want to introduce a term that you probably know, but not maybe not everybody who's watching knows is myofascia. Maybe we know about it from myofascial release or myofascia massage, but myofascia is an, a term to describe both the muscle and the connective tissue that surrounds it. And I think this is important to mention because what we think of as muscle is, doesn't exist. We have myofascia and mm -hmm. because they're completely intertwined right down to the cellular level. And so we can't, we can't separate the two. And the reason why I bring this up is because when we talk about the differences between yin yoga and hatha yoga or vinyasa yoga is we talk a lot of, well, yin yoga targets the connective tissue, but that makes it sound like it doesn't target muscles at all mm -hmm. or that other types of yoga don't affect connective tissue. Because anytime we're moving, anytime we're loading our tissues, it affects both. We're affecting both muscle and connective tissue. But nevertheless, um, muscle fibers and connective tissue fibers respond differently to different types of loads, whether we're talking about compression, you know, when you bend your elbow, this is a joint that's compressed, or, um, you know, when you stretch, that's called tensile load. And then we also have, you know, the kind of loading that we get when we go to gym and, and do weights or the kind of loading that happens when we run and the impacts of that. So all of those kinds of movements affect the tissues in different ways. So we know that muscle likes repetition and progressive weight or, um, uh, yeah, so repetition and progressive weight. That's how muscles grow um, bigger and stronger. And actually they grow, they do that because we kind of break them a little and then they, they reform and they regrow stronger in anticipation of more stimulus like that. Mm -hmm. Connective tissue, it's all still connected, but it, it, it takes something different. It, it tends to, well, let me back up. Different connective tissue <laughs> <laughs> likes different things. So, so we're not subdividing it even further. And, and this is something I think that um, people who teach in yoga should be really careful about um, lumping everything in together because some connective tissue actually likes more dynamic, more young um, loads, particularly tendons, which their elastic properties um, create a lot of bounce. So you know, like Michael Jordan, his ability to jump really high comes from 
really super strong tendons. And he trained that up by, by jumping. So if you want really strong elastic tendons, you do things that create really strong elastic tendons. So it's, it's not, it's not accurate to say that yin yoga really targets tendons, but it does target some of the tissues that are wrapped and intertwined around the muscles. And what's happening on the physiological level with these long, sustained, passive stretches is actually taking what might be kind of felt like poorly formed fascia and, and reforming it or reorganizing it um, into what's called, a, I'm just trying to make a hand here, um, <laughs> like a lattice, you know, like those fences that have the crisscross. So it's a lattice formation. And when fascia is like this, it stretches in the right ways or it, it moves in the right ways. It's stronger in other ways and it performs better. And the kinds of things that fascia does to perform is um, it transmits load. So when we jump, it gets absorbed in our body better. And we don't feel like our bones are rattling. Um, when we step off a curb funny, we absorb that load and are less likely to get injured. Um, we feel less rickety. We feel a little more um, graceful and smooth in our movement. Well-formed fascia also creates better glide amongst our tissues because of the, the lubricating gel-like fluid that's also present. So, so yin yoga does target connective tissue. Not all the connective tissue, but it does it does provide some nutrition for our tissues that other forms of exercise don't. So I hope that answers your question a little bit. Does, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, and I'm, all I'm, of your people are still with us. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there's so much more to say, but we can put some oh, yeah. links to for people who are interested to learn more. And, um, Hey, I've had um, kind of on this more physiological level, I've had a couple people out, um, asking about scar tissues who have just come away from surgery and looking for a yoga practice that can help them with their scar tissues. So do you think yeah. that yin yoga is the right practice for that and kind of how can that help? Yeah, so this is why I had to tell you a little bit about this form fashion. <laughs> um, First of all, I want to say that there's there's some misinformation in the world in general about how much we can manually affect scar tissue. You know, we've got we've got fascia blaster and foam rolling and massage, all claiming that we can go in there and break up scar tissue. The thing about scar tissue is it's it's really strong. In fact, all of the connective tissue is really strong, pound for pound. The collagen fibers in our fascia and our connective tissue are stronger than steel. And so the idea that we could just kind of get in there with our hands and, and break it up is almost kind of absurd. <laughs> in fact, you know, when they do, when, you know, a doctor goes in or a surgeon goes in and, and cuts us open, they have to use like the strongest thing they can find, you know, this, I'm sorry, the sharpest. It has to be, you know, an extremely sharp knife to mm. cut into this tissue. So I, I think that's something to keep in mind. If we break it up, if we could, it's going to hurt. <laughs> it's going <laughs> to really hurt. So, you know, you know, to do something to really get in there and change it, um, especially in a short amount of time is, is going to be hard. And then, and then the tricky thing is that the longer you wait to deal with your scar tissue, the harder it's going to be to, to, to change it. So this is why a lot of the protocols with surgery now is to get people up and moving right away not let people just sit around and wait to heal. They've, they've got to um, tell the cells that create new tissue to form this better formed tissue in the first place, right? So mm -hmm. rather than let it get all gummy and felt like and, and adhesions around the scar tissue, if we move while we're healing, we have a better chance of forming the tissue that's a little bit more like this. Mm -hmm. What happens when you haven't done that? And that's the big question, right? So what I think yin yoga can do, the sustained stretching over time, just like it would do for anybody, is it can help to reorganize the tissues back into something very close to this lattice formation. But when we talk about changing tissue, it's we're talking six months to two years with regular attention. So it's not... Fascia time is, is much more drawn out than muscle time when it mm -hmm. comes to strengthening and reformatting it and, 
and healing. So I just want everybody to keep that in mind that there's no quick fix here. Mm -hmm. Um, But I do think that over time, we do experience those changes. And coming back to my postpartum experiences, I had through inactivity, you know, scar tissue is one way that we get really malformed and disorganized fascia. Immobility is another way that that happens. And so I, I had that experience postpartum after, you know, 10 months of being pregnant and then about a year of recovery. I, I had lost all of my well-formed fashion. I remember going out for a hike and, and feeling like about 30 years older than I was. <laughs> just didn't feel like I had the the internal composition to handle that activity. And over time, I'm back to where I was. So mm-hmm. you know, have faith. You can do something about it. It's just going to take a little time mm-hmm. and diligence. Yeah. And so I suppose not only for people who have had surgery but anyone who's perhaps been bed bound can really benefit from the practice yeah yeah and as soon as you can get up and do more things because remember the yin only targets a subset of connective tissue you still got the other connective tissues and the muscles as soon as you can get yourself up and moving even more even Mm -hmm. better we have to have a lot of variety Mm -hmm. movement thanks lovely um (laughs) So yeah, let's talk a little bit about, so speaking of people who may be bed bound or almost bed bound, how can yin yoga help people who, with chronic fatigue, who are always tired and have severe lack of energy? Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So let's see, this is where we get to talk about the non-physical parts of practice, right? So we have um, the energetics of yoga. Many of us know about the nadis and prana and how the life force energy flows through rivers or channels through the body and and basically animates us. In Chinese medicine, this is qi. Um, Oftentimes it's referred to as the spark in the machine. So without qi, we wouldn't be alive and and breathing and moving around. Mm -hmm. And what I love about the Chinese Chinese meridian system that's mapped onto the yin practice is that it gets a little more precise. So instead of having 70,000 energy channels, in Chinese medicine we have 14. And of those 14 channels that we, we work with, in yin yoga, we, we look at about 10 of them. And then they're, they're organized into pairs. So now we're down to five things to keep track of. And each of these pairs is associated with specific physiological functions in the body, emotional qualities, mind states, um, sense of well-being, and connection in the world. Because the energy channels are mapped to landmarks in the body, we can... You know, we can say that um, the channels that relate to, say, liver and gallbladder um, run through the hips. So that's a physical landmark that we can target. We can then say, okay, well, poses like swan or pigeon in hatha yoga um, target the hip. So if we if we do pigeon, then we're targeting the hip, which means we're targeting the liver and gallbladder meridians. So we can sit down, and I mentioned this before, kind of assess yourself. How am I doing physically, emotionally, energetically, all of these things? And then I can say, okay, well, it feels like I might be having um, some kidney issues. Kidney is associated with um, our energy level and our, our sense of vitality and vigor. Basically, we're all depleted in our kidney channel. <laughs> and so we can, we can say, okay, well, I'm feeling depleted. I'm feeling overwhelmed and run down. I'm going to do some kidney kidney poses and try to boost my chi there. And so this is one way that I think is is really exciting for people who are, again, looking to create um, a better environment for healing to occur. I don't think that we can cure ourselves with, with the poses, but I do think that we can set ourselves up for um more successful interventions, whatever else they might be. So that's how I use the practice a lot. And like I mentioned, I go to my Chinese medicine doctor and he's, I'm, I'm constantly dealing with kidney and spleen, you know, do kidney and spleen, do kidney and spleen poses. 
And so that's what I do. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So that's, yeah, that's really helpful. So people can, yeah, target specific areas to help build up that chi. Yeah. Really yeah. All right. What advice do you have to people with joint and muscle pain or with any chronic illnesses that might be interested in, in trying a yin yoga practice? Yeah. So the answer is very similar to what I would tell anybody starting a yoga practice is it's really helpful if you know, or you can know what's causing the pain just to rule out any contraindications. And, um, and this is important, even with my back condition, I, I thought it was one thing for a really long time. And I kept focusing on that for, uh, you know, and, and it wasn't helping. And then I discovered, oh, well, the reason I was having this back pain was more of a congenital spinal condition. And the answer was not to target my hips, but to quit doing back bends. <laughs> as soon as I quit doing back bends, I had an 80% reduction in pain almost immediately. Wow. Um, so I, it is beneficial to, if you can, know what it is so you can avoid the things that could be making it worse. Um, and then, you know, ease into it. Um, go into it with a spirit of interest and curiosity and understand that some things aren't going to work. And that doesn't mean that you have to give the whole thing up and throw it all away. You know, one thing I love about yin is that, um, it's very simple. You can, you can kind of switch things around and no one's going to um, get on you about whether or not your poses look a certain way. You can incorporate props and you can really make the poses work for you rather than being in an environment where sometimes it feels like we're being kind of fitted into the poses and not the other way around. So I think, I think that is one of the nice things about yin is that it's, it's really, um, open to interpretation. And that's, that's really good for people who are navigating conditions that um, are often mysterious. And the other thing I would I haven't brought up yet that I think is probably pretty interesting mm -hmm. is um, the concept of proprioception, which is the awareness of how our body moves around in space. So it's it's the reason why I can touch my nose without looking in a mirror. Mm -hmm. And so um, there have been studies that show that if we lack proprioception, then we're more likely to experience pain. And this is this is kind of really exciting for anybody practicing any kind of yoga because I think it does naturally build up our proprioceptive powers. But with yin yoga in particular, because you're not doing anything else but being in the pose, feeling what you're feeling, you're not you're not orchestrating more movement, you're not trying to keep up, you're not you're not wondering if you're doing it right. You're just there with yourself experiencing feelings. You, you get a really sweet opportunity to to hone those proprioceptive skills. And so I think that's a really um, exciting part about um, yin yoga and its, and its offering to people who are navigating pain in particular. Yeah, that's yeah. so interesting. I hadn't heard that before. That's yeah, so it's pretty it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so I would recommend um, the work of a teacher named Jules Mitchell. Mm -hmm. And she's a she's not a yin teacher, but she she's a biomechanics um, person as well as is a, a yoga teacher. And she's she's kind of traveling around now, um, talking about proprioception and the importance of changing up our movement patterns so that we build up even more proprioception. So mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of cool to see where that's going to take us. That's really cool. Uh, <laughs> last question: Do you have anything else? To add, um, you know, I, I think it's important. This is just based on my own experience to not just look at our movement, but look at everything. You know, what are you eating? How are you sleeping? What what is what is the atmosphere that you live in, and who's around you, and and what are they feeding you <laughs> through <laughs> your mind and through their interactions with you? Um, I think yoga is really helpful for. Um, coping with some of the things that we have, you know, we can't choose our family, but we can learn methods. And I think yoga is a great place to learn this too. Um, taking what we need and, and, and letting the rest kind of flow through us <laughs> and, 
um, you know, find other ways of of being kind and sweet to yourself. I think yin yoga is a great way to do that. But, you know, if it's taking walks, do that, you know, whatever, mm-hmm. whatever you can do to create mm-hmm. that atmosphere mm-hmm. of healing and support um, is, is going to go a long way for a lot of people, I think. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for sharing yeah, your knowledge and your wisdom with us. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to be really helpful to so many people. Great. Um, so yeah, just tell us, say, how can people work with you? Kind of what do you have coming up? Okay. Um, well, I'm in the Washington DC area in mm. the United States. Um, I am offering a yin yoga teacher training in the fall. So if you're in the area and you want to check that out, um, you can visit my website at sati.yoga and that will, there's a big thing on the homepage mm. that will get you there. I have a an online course that I'm going to be relaunching all about fascia. So if you like the anatomy and the fascia physiology and you want to know more about that, it's it's much more of a, a kind of lecture format. Um, but it's self it'll be a self paced online course that you can you can take and learn more about that too. So lovely, yeah. sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you so much. You're very welcome, Kayla, and and. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.